The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health has called on the U.S. Supreme Court to uphold the right to abortion in America or risk undermining international human rights law and threatening that right elsewhere in the world. Let's speak now to Dr. Taleng Mofokeng for more on this. Thank you very much for availing yourself uh, this morning. Is it as easy as that really? Oh, definitely not. Uh, we know that globally the fight um, against women's rights, particularly the right to illegal and safe abortion, is constantly under attack, right? Um, and as someone whose job is to monitor trends and respond to issues of human rights, um, abuses, potential or ongoing or past, and report those to the Human Rights Council, I can tell you that what's happening right now in the United States in the Supreme Court um, is not isolated. We've seen the same in Europe, um, in, in many other countries before COVID, but also during COVID, um, where people accelerated and, and intensified their efforts to change laws that guaranteed access to safe and legal abortion. However, what's different in the U.S. is that it is a United Supreme Court, and a lot of other countries can and do draw on it for jurisprudence, and we know this can set a very bad uh, legal precedence for other countries globally as well. And that's just it. Let's expand on that point. Should this go through, it will have far-reaching consequences. If we take a look at our continent in particular and our relationship with special or certain rather NGOs that operate uh, within this space, what does that spell for us? It's disastrous. And I think for many people in the country, they talk about this issue as if it's a potential future problem. And what we know for sure is that there's a lot of um, pregnancy crisis centers who brand themselves as centers that are there for people who are pregnant, who need assistance with a safe abortion, only for them to get there and to, to be preyed upon. They get given the Bible and they actually get dissuaded from making that particular decision and then accessing that health care they wanted. A lot of the NGOs are funded by um, religious organizations and institutions. A lot of what's happening right now in the Department of Basic Education in West Africa, in East Africa, and in some parts of reported in South Africa, you have also, again, um, a very extreme fundamentalist um, uh, uh, religious organizations and groupings who are funding organizations that have now focused on education and, and actually making sure that children do not also get access to comprehensive sexuality and gender education where they would get in structured learning in schools the knowledge about what their rights are, the knowledge about their bodies, the knowledge about all of the different pregnancy outcomes. What's also happening is that even in civil society, you have a very sustained and well-organized and well-funded machinery that works to impede at every level, whether it's at the level of health systems, whether it's at the level of clinical care, whether it's at the level of the legislature. By the way, we've also had multiple attempts in our own National Assembly where people wanted to overturn our own choice on termination of pregnancy act. And when you see where the money is flowing from, you can see those foreign elements. And often they, 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 they like to um, accuse women, right, who are feminists and, and who are fighting for their rights as agents of foreign uh, 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 agents. In fact, they are the ones who are getting money from other countries, from other organizations, to advance in the region, in the Africa region, Sub-Sahara, um, East and West Africa, these very anti-human rights uh, theology, very anti-human rights um, culture and societies. And, and so children grow up in communities that are not affirming of who they truly are. Hmm. You speak of the power behind this, right? And some sectors of society have also pointed out that in terms of the composition of the uh, justices or judges on the Supreme Court that would ultimately then uh, have to deliberate on this decision, uh, do we find that women are a part of these decisions that are being made? So there's two ways to look at it, right? Um, we can talk about the issue that we want more women in positions of leadership and in positions where they can influence um, decisions and change, right, the power dynamics. But it means we also want women who understand the importance of these rights. We want women and men in those positions 
who are supportive and affirming of everyone's human rights. In my opinion, especially in these particular issues, it's no use just having more women on the bench if they're going to be conservative, if they're going to be harmful um, to these very issues. And this is what we've seen um, happening in, in, in the U.S. I mean, during the, the interviews of these, some of these Supreme um, Court judges, they were already clearly um, articulating their anti-choice um, positions even through those interviews. So we can't expect that once they become judges, they would suddenly change and become people who are affirming of, of autonomy and bodily integrity and that basic human right and the ability to self-determine. And I think that's the difficulty is that, I mean, this, this Roe versus Wade, by the way, is a 1973 court ruling, right? And it has received challenges upon challenges since 1973. That tells us as South Africans that our own Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act from 1996, 1997, is actually still very young. And so we also need to think very clearly um, and very well about how are we going to protect this right because it's not just a given that these rights will not be taken away. And that's the danger with the U.S. Supreme Court judgment right now is that what they are embarking on is a process of regression. It's a process of taking away rights that were already protected by the Constitution. And that is a very, very bad precedence for the region in terms of North America, but also for the global community as well, where we know um, that um, jurisprudence, as much as sometimes they would like to say that international human rights doesn't affect domestic human rights, but we know that it does. And where it suits particular people and particular agendas, they are able to draw on this particular jurisprudence to advance particular agendas. And this is very harmful to those people who have the ability to get pregnant, who may want to end a pregnancy. Uh, what is it that then you and I uh, can do, especially here at home, uh, to lobby around not just awareness of this issue, but to ensure that there's protection uh, of women to enjoy the right to terminate should they choose to? It's a very important question, and I think advocacy in this area is very important. And in my particular instance, for example, I've decided to focus on assisting um, healthcare workers broadly, but specifically nurses and doctors in understanding human rights, in understanding international human rights laws and principles, in understanding the different ways in which their practice of medicine on a daily basis is in protection of those rights. So the key principles of dignity, privacy, confidentiality, non-discrimination, equality, um, but also literally thinking about the different ways in which our, in which our patients, the clients we see, have to navigate on a daily basis a very difficult um, situation socioeconomically, um, that by the time they see me or another nurse or another doctor, they really had to go through so many hurdles that that particular consultation has to be treated with a, a seriousness um, and, 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 and medical ethics that it requires because for many people, that's the only chance that they'll ever have to see a healthcare worker to assist them in this process, to give them accurate information, to provide them the procedure timelessly, and also to refer them on for further care um, when, when those are, are needed. The other problem I can tell you now is that in the African continent, unlike the U.S., a lot of the non-governmental organizations and women-run institutions and feminist movements are actually supported and funded by U.S. companies and other individuals in the U.S. who have made money, right? And we don't have that in Africa. We don't have that in South Africa. So this defense that you talk about, unfortunately, then lies on individual people and their ability to mobilize their own resource and often self-funding a lot of these programs, a lot of this work of defending the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, even in the National Assembly. So I think we need to change the way we think about, firstly, global aid and philanthropy, and think about how, if we want to democratize global health, and we want to move away from dependency of external and foreign aid, how are we then locally in mm -hmm. South Africa going to support the people who do this very work, mm -hmm. who've done it for so long, unsupported, often discriminated themselves from doing this work. Mm -hmm. So that's the main challenge, I think, um, that we have, is that we are not getting the actual resources to fight back an entire system that itself is very well funded and very well financed. Mm. United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Dr. Taleng Mofugeng, thank you very much for availing yourself this morning.